So it started off, as all good things do, at an Indian wedding. I was back home in December 2016 for my first winter break from college when I saw my favorite uncle, who's known as the style icon of the family, wearing his trademark fancy suit but very bulky shoes and he looked somewhat timid and uncomfortable. He didn't want to get up from the table and he went right at the back during the family photograph. So I was curious as to what was going on. So I asked my father and he told me that my uncle was recently diagnosed with diabetic neuropathy and he hadn't been the same ever since. So what was diabetic neuropathy and why did he have to wear footwear that looked like that? So I decided to take a step back and I realized that every 20 seconds, one foot is lost due to diabetes in the world today. And over half of these could be prevented if people just wore the correct footwear. In fact, there are over 425 million plus diabetics worldwide and over 40% of them will require this footwear. So you might be wondering, how are diabetes and footwear even related? I thought diabetes was a sugar-related condition. So diabetes causes sugar buildup in the feet, which causes the nerves to lose sensation. And hence, any small cuts, bruises, or wounds that take place on your foot make the foot not able to feel it because of the loss of sensation, and so it can't heal it. The loss of sensation is so bad that one day I remember someone told me she saw blood on the floor and she just didn't know where it was coming from. Later, she looked under her foot and saw that a nail had pierced through and she just didn't realize. So to sort of safeguard this foot, they need to wear special kinds of footwear. And this footwear is very big and bulky and people just don't want to wear it. I remember during one of our market surveys, um, someone told me, hey, Vidan, how can I wear that, that shoe? I'd rather lose my foot than wear that. This was a joke and a seemingly improbable possibility. But 14 months later, he had two of his toes amputated. To me, this just seems like an unfair choice. Why should someone have to choose between looking good and saving their foot? There has to be a better way. So I decided to apply for a research grant to create fused diabetic dress shoes, which combine medical performance and chic style. I went to my faculty mentor, Dr. Mark Sivak, to understand the design thinking process because this to me seemed like a very daunting task. Big brands had tried and the results were clear for everyone to see. So we wanted to create footwear that was hyper-specific to the needs of the key stakeholders. So thus began my first phase of research where I went back to India and I spoke to 200 plus patients, diabetologists and podiatrists to understand from all of these people, what do they expect from diabetic footwear? Then we put it all together and I built this on top of existing literature, literature to identify four fundamental design goals, which was to evenly dis distribute plantar pressure, to accommodate bone deformities, to reduce shear and friction and to prevent external shock. Now that we knew this, I had to put it in a shoe. So I decided to pack my bags and fly to Italy, the shoemaking capital of the world. And I landed in Civitanova Marche, which is a small little town which speaks no language other than Italian, to learn how to make shoes. I went in without a plan, and this wasn't a great idea. So I just walk around and talk to anyone I knew to ask them, hey, who can help me make this diabetic footwear? And then they'd point me to a direction, literally so, and I'd walk over or hitch a ride and continue my quest there. In this process, I, I stumbled across a mom and pop factory which had been making diabetic footwear for the last 40 odd years. And uh, over there, with the help of a lot of sign language, I got a total masterclass on how to make diabetic footwear, how to think about materials, leather, shoe components, fit, they knew it all. So after that, I was ready. For the third phase of our research, I went back to India where I was repeatedly iterating and prototyping and we gave out samples to doctors and patients and so on to get their feedback. 
And for the fourth phase, I came back to school in Boston and I spoke to thought leaders in the medical industry here to understand, you know, are we in line with where the industry is headed? So we repeated this four phase design cycle twice over the course of two years. And at the end of which we had our solution, which looked like this. Now, I, I, I remember speaking at a conference where we had 100 plus people there and uh, I gave a 30 second introduction to what we were doing. And a quarter of the audience came up to me and said, you know, hey, Vidan, where can we buy this for my father, for my uncle and so on? So I said, okay, people really wanted what we have. So then I said, okay, let me test uh, some sales channels. And then I spoke to some doctors and distributors who said, yes, this is great. When can you get it to us? And I said, I don't know. So at that point, I realized that I, I needed to go all in on this to actually make this big. And so I decided to take eight months off from school to go back to India to start this company. Although I'd grown up in India, I didn't quite realize just how difficult it is to work there. We spent the first four months just trying to set up the entity and figure out the regulatory landscape we were going to operate in. Production was extremely difficult and had a lot of delays because yeah, we were producing small quantities and factories didn't give us the importance uh, that we needed. So it was just very hard. And for someone like me, who's impatient and when I want something, I want it now, this was very frustrating. If I were to describe a production in India in two words, it was stuff happens. I remember one day uh, we had 30 plus customers waiting for the orders and my shoe order was delayed by 45 days. So I called up my factory and said, you know, hey, what happened? Uh, it's been a week. Uh, it's been so long. When can I get it? And they said, sir, you know, the ring around your shoelaces, the rest of it is ready. We just ran out of those. So it's going to take a week more. So we had a lot of adjusting to do. We had a lot of learning to do. And now we work with much smaller factories who are more agile in their processes and so on. So Starting a company is an emotional roller coaster because the fortunes of the company are tied to your own emotions. So I remember one day um, we 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 didn't we weren't getting enough sales in. I'd hired the wrong team, and our production was all over the place. So I just came back home and I dove headfirst into bed and I said, you know, this is it. I don't want to do this anymore. So then my parents, who'd been my therapists for the last, for all my life basically, they said, you know, Vidhan, you've gotten this far only because you kept pushing. You just never, never gave up. And, you know, why don't you just go out, go get some fresh air and uh, go for a drive. So I went for a drive and I landed up in the lane of my high school. So I was sitting there listening to music and reminiscing about times past when a thought struck my mind. Would my high school self be proud of where I was today? And the answer to that was a resounding yes. And I decided that no, I gotta, gotta pick myself back up and bring the mojo back. I often sort of talk about how my spirit animal is a cockroach. It's on my LinkedIn bio, I'm not even kidding. Cockroaches have outlasted dinosaurs and they will survive on hair, grease and glue, but they will survive. And I just believe that persistence as an analogy to entrepreneurship is just perhaps the most important virtue that you could have while starting off. So we decided to pick ourselves back up, keep pushing, and today we're in 85 plus hospitals and clinics across a few cities. So the message I'd have for you today is that the best time for you to start a company is right now. If you have an idea, if you have something that you've been thinking about, Go out, go talk to people, go build something and just see if people are excited about it. And if not, fail quickly and get back up again. For me, I was in college around an infrastructure that was designed to help me succeed. I had phenomenal mentors who cared about what I was doing and I had relatively few responsibilities. I was able to talk to some incredibly busy people. If I thoughtfully reached out to them and told them, you know, why I wanted to talk to them because who doesn't want to help a college student, right? So while starting a company is an emotional struggle and I do want to assure you that once you find that thing that tugs away at your heartstrings, it'll be so, so worth it. Because at the end of the day, 
you're only going to regret the chances that you did not take. Thank you.